It's time for another adventure in my favorite burnout genre, the beat-em-up MMO. After losing the flashy action of Rusty Hearts, Dark Blood, and Hero Wars to the server shutdown void, it's always welcome to see another entry that seems at least halfway competent. This time, Unmoss manages to wrangle over an old title with plenty of flash, but will it have enough substance? This is the MMO Grinder, and it's time to look at Critica. Not to be confused by its mobile version, the amusingly titled Critica the White Knights, Critica Online is the PC version of the game that originally was released several years ago. Its tagline, All Killer No Filler, is about what I'd expect from Monmas' marketing that brought us true action combat and the ultimate shooter playground. Punchy, distinct, and not even remotely representative of the actual product, but we'll get into that. Despite what some places are saying, I'll state it once again, no, this is not a port of the mobile game. We may be seeing it far after that version white knighted its way onto the hearts of the App Store, but PC did come first, and parts of that might become glaringly obvious as we continue. Stretch your torso and let's bounce into it. Critica certainly won't be winning any awards for graphical prowess, but at the very least it looks unique and has a good variety for enemy designs and locations. Yet perhaps one of the biggest flaws that stands out are the cutscenes, which really show their age. Think 480p with quite a bit of static and popping in them. In fact, the general quality on close inspection is incredibly rough, with many people, including my co-writer, actually thinking this was just a straight mobile port, but seriously, it is the other way around. Aesthetically, things are a bit odd, but far more unified. As you progress in the game, you'll be sent to various hubs from which you'll launch into the actual missions, and each hub has its own look paired with each mission of that hub having a set theme. This ensures variety at first, but we'll get more into that in the gameplay. When you're playing through these missions, there wasn't really a time where something seemed out of place, given the area, but the oddity comes in when you realize the progress, from forest town to small town to capital city to winter mountain to slums and then pirate town, these transitions just feel a bit jarring, but are very welcome. In keeping with odd themes, we just have to say, dat art though, cause boy does this game scream breasts. There was definite effort put into the artwork for each character, most of which emphasize a female chest, and particular standouts being one we've named Torso Girl. Look at her. Just drink that shit in. It's like she has double the set of ribs of a normal human being. At least you can say the art style is very anime, sometimes even to a fault, or you'd swear a character looks incredibly familiar to someone else from a more notable franchise. The style at least lends itself to interesting looking designs that they've chosen. The game definitely has some noteworthy music heavy, visceral guitar rock that would make a great stand-in for the Guilty Gear soundtrack. However, as much as I enjoy it, there are two major issues that come about. The first is that the sound effects are so overblown that it could just be hard to hear the music. The second and far more amusing issue is that the music will have an almost audible clunk as the track just stops suddenly and sits silent sometimes for minutes before the track will either decide to replay or a new one will start. This means you can have some rather pumping metal music as you're in the middle of a boss fight before it just suddenly goes all silent. We joked more than a few times that it was the game just being too shocked by the absurd power levels of pain that we were pumping out to keep playing its music. Even with all the intensity of the music, you'll find what seems to be very little of it in overall variety. Town themes are an entirely different genre half the time, but each dungeon and boss track tends to jump around a very small track list with very short loops. The sound design itself is another manner, as they are incredibly loud, clashing constantly against everything with every same attack, collision, and power used, amplified ever stronger with each enemy hit, especially with multiple enemies grouped up in one attack combo. Enemies will also scream out snippets of voice clips and yells when attacked or attacking as well. Many of your character's attacks will even have voice snippets with them. Certainly one of the weirder and weaker aspects of the game is a lot of the voice work on display, especially from NPCs. Though some will dip into rather intentionally comical, like the Warp Mage's tech puns and singing Black Hole Sun, while others were just unintentionally hilarious. Another glorious day in the war! As some audio dialogue is played out with certain attacks every time, they can stand out rather notably. 
Key Among Grindstone is the Reaper's To Heaven, To Hell, which just sounds silly to begin with and makes only tangential sense to the move it's associated with. Starting out is simple enough as you need to pick your character, and while there is some customization within the game, allowing you plenty of choices for the character's color scheme and a few slightly differing faces, you won't really break away from a specific look of each of the classes, as they're more or less characters. These classes are as follows. Warrior is a more tanky, direct damage focused class that starts out somewhat slower but will mow through enemies and knock them around with ease. The Rogue is a combo and speed focused class initially, with plenty of interesting attacks and combos at close and occasionally far range. The Gun Mage is an elf wizard that uses guns and heavy ordnance to accent his magical abilities, focusing on AoE with a few single target attacks. The Reaper is another combo focused class that can also use health training and longer range sweeping attacks. Once you make it to level 15 with any of these classes, you can select an advanced class for your specific character. And unfortunately, there's a few odd quirks with that. While these classes can drastically change the combat and feel of your class, you've only just started to get the hang of, you can't test out these classes before you're forced to choose one. Your NPC will demonstrate some of the basic moves of that advanced class for you, but as far as testing them out yourself, it only comes about after you've chosen this unchangeable commitment. It's a little BS. Keep also in mind that if you reach level 15 before a certain section of the main quest, the game will allow you to enter the class change area and inform you that it's time to change your class, but won't actually have the quest for you to do so, leaving you running around trapped within the arena wondering if there was anything else you're supposed to do before it starts. We've so much still to do! This is also where things like combat get a bit more ridiculous. See, combat as a whole feels far more about big damage numbers and over-the-top animations, essentially style over substance. Enemy bosses can have 70 health bars, and this is only to make it so that when your attacks do hundreds of thousands of damage, they won't die outright. This extends to standard enemies as well, who can have multiple health bars, yet even ones with a single health bar could still have millions of HP. So it really just exaggerates the numbers to make you feel stronger, but you're not really going anywhere. The multiple boss bars seem like a good way to make you feel more powerful by shaving off several health bars with one good barrage, but they don't serve any different technical purpose than just giving them a massive single health bar would. So what does that have to do with the advanced classes? Well, most advanced classes will begin getting even flashier with more impactful abilities, but you just don't feel like you're truly some godlike warrior. It also doesn't help that the game is incredibly repetitive, not just because you'll be doing the same attacks over and over again, but because you'll play the exact same level multiple times before your story will progress to the next one. This means you'll have to fight the exact same boss, sometimes even five times in a row, before your main mission will finally tell you that you've beaten through it enough. While this is pretty typical of the genre, it can lead to heavy burnout quickly, though you can easily slip into autopiloting through fights and encounters, so it's a bit of a mixed bag. It doesn't help that the game isn't really difficult at all either. Myself and Dresker always played on insane difficulty, and barring a boss attack that was incredibly fast and did a lot of damage, there wasn't really a time we thought that anything was a challenge. While bosses themselves can have really interesting fight mechanics, one of the byproducts of insane difficulty is the common issue of insta-kill or near insta-kill attacks from bosses and elite enemies, some of them with little to no proper telegraphs if they aren't already being obscured by the particle effect storm of your character or party. Some bosses are even fully immune from any forms of control or stun, or will have a hyper armor in their attack mechanics that render those moves useless. Most frustrating is the semi-rare but still too common occurrence of wasting a resurrection token on a boss immune to these things, who will then kill you during the forced summon animation since they didn't get knocked down by the protective spell of you being resummoned. While this grants the only real feel of difficulty within the game, turning this down even by one slight point into the hard mode makes so many of these formerly tense fights more or less complete pushovers. With so much emphasis on big numbers over substance, a lot of the fights become pretty tedious as you shave off two or three of the hundred health bars per combo. Again, rather standard for the genre. The minor difference is that when leveling up, your skills just don't immediately get better, and instead you're given points to spend on upgrading those skills. At first, you can feel free to upgrade everything you have, but as you get later into the game, you're almost required to respec your character and only choose upgrades for skills that you know you're going to get use out of. Fortunately, respecing isn't too inconvenient, and you get them at important points, so your character can feel a lot better to play once you've cut out a lot of the dead weight. 
On top of this, gear has some interesting stats. Not just ones that are straight benefits to you, but stats with specific modifiers like doing more damage to bosses, or taking less damage from bosses, perhaps having a higher crit chance on elite enemies, or so on. This can be a bit of a double-edged sword, as sometimes you'll find new gear that is just slightly better stat-wise than the gear you have now, but because it doesn't have that extra damage to bosses, it might not be worth it. Another bonus that you may enjoy is the name of the old item. After all, they essentially just throw random words together, like Incredibly Bonkers Mundane Travel Hat. How could you not love contradictory item names like that? If you want to keep around your old gear, you can always try to reinforce it by making it a higher level item with certain limits depending on the rarity of the gear. To do this, simply head to a blacksmith anvil, which will be marked as a reinforcing station, and place the item that you want to reinforce into the slot. From here, select what type of whetstone you want to use, and then pull the lever and pray. If you succeed, you'll take the item up in rank. Should you fail, you'll increase a luck pool that makes the next attempt more likely until you succeed again. If you want to replace an item you have reinforced, you can transfer those levels to another item of the same type, though it has to fit within certain restrictions that the anvil will tell you. Outside of this, the game actually does have a crafting system in place, albeit coming into the fold rather late in the game's leveling curve, though you can craft some minor consumables early on. Once you do gain the ability to craft gear, you'll note that it requires some pretty hefty drops and a sizable amount of gold coins. Essentially, make absolutely sure you want to craft that item as it can be far more beneficial to save all those materials and resources for higher level crafting recipes. It should also be noted that crafting itself doesn't have a level. You simply gain better recipes as you progress in the game and go to various crafting stations. This is somewhat hand-waved away as you're commissioning a weapon slash armorsmith to make these items for you and you're just providing materials. This section won't be very long as the game really doesn't have as much of a community content as you would think. I mean, sure, you have the typical parties and guild systems, with guilds granting skills that can give buffs to all members for a time, but there isn't really a community interaction per se. For example, you won't be trading, as the trade system isn't in the game, and the auction house only allows for real money currency to be exchanged for gear, while an exception is made for a few items that can use gold. Hubs won't have that many players, partially because the servers are separated into so many shards, and mostly to keep the load light on the system. Really, the majority of interaction with the community as a whole will come down to sending server-wide broadcast messages using Megaphone, and the occasional request for a trade in trade channels, which, with no trade system in place, I'm not exactly sure how that works. So the community is more of who you would choose to bring along with you in your adventures, and thankfully partying is rather simple and gives us the benefit of clearing stages faster. The end of the match will even offer up a choice of bonuses to the match's MVP, which is rather pointless as you can't see what each card has what bonus placed on it in the first place, but you do get a pretty cool splash screen for the player that's granted this title. Once you reach a high enough level, you can even do daily dungeons. But these aren't your standard overarching plots or anything, they just contain more single-room combat arenas against bosses before you leave. Sometimes this is all too typical with MMOs, each party member you're with will be on the same or similar mission, but credit for that mission may or may not be shared, especially those where you're asked to get a kill combo or a kill streak, making partying with other players an occasional detriment to your progress. The game is repetitive enough when you have to head into the same dungeon five times or more just to go through the normal quest progression, so adding another trip because you weren't able to get quest credit from one of your runs just feels miserable. There is a PvP mode within the game, but the current PvP population, at least around level 50, doesn't seem to be very active, as queue times are incredibly long, to the point of often timing out. The few times I was able to even see a lobby, there were players of what seemed to be merely trading victories back and forth to get their event quest done or completely one-sided matches that was only able to observe and never participate in. Chats are able to comment and talk with anyone who's in the room, even if they aren't actively fighting. So some who have managed to pull in some fight time have told me how they were heckled for their skill choices. I honestly don't know what I was expecting here. One major item that runs through the cash shop, rather expectedly, is the robust selection of cosmetics. Well, semi-robust, as there are a lot of options, but slightly inflated by the amount of colors available for each costume. But it's not exactly lacking in designs, either. A point of possible contention is that stats are available on each costume piece, as a small selection of specific boosts. 
While that might have people want to start ringing in the alarm, let it be known that costumes can be earned in-game through various quests and events. The only downside being that you can't choose what outfit you get, only what slot it goes in. But if it's just the stats you're after, you'll be fine eventually just earning them if you're not willing to fork over cash. One easy way to get a ton of goodies and boosts is to invest in the monthly Elite status, which is every free-to-play game subscription-style mode. This one's a little more generous than most, offering up plenty of useful potions to have better chances at gear, heal up better, reset skill points, gain some extra cred and costume die points, but it's all up to you if it's worth that investment. It won't make or break your play either way, unless you're a complete min-maxer, as I was decked out in every costume slot, with elite status in tow, and Dresker was still able to keep up with or outpace me in some dungeons. Just not levels. So I guess if you're in a mad dash to cap, you might want to consider that too. Critica is a pretty good distraction. It's all about the basics I would expect from a beat-em-up. Short, punchy dungeons, some enemy grinding, flashy effects, and combos. It's all here. But with that, there doesn't seem to be much to set it apart. Most people who play it would immediately toss out comparisons to others, like BFO or Rusty Hearts, showing that this genre, while rife with opportunity, rarely takes the time to break new ground. If the aesthetic works for you, go for it. But if you burnt out on one of these titles already, it's likely you'll burn out on this one all the more quicker. It's a fun ride while it lasts, though. Here's my final rating. Provided you start with the right class, you may find this game one of the more intense action experiences in the genre. Get some skills unlocked, and you might have a blast mowing down enemies with a plethora of attacks and finding interesting ways to chain combos together while avoiding some pretty intense boss mechanics. The game doesn't feel all that taxing to run, so players with less than optimal PCs may have luck giving this game a go, even with all the intense looking effects. As I said, classes might make the game for you. My first impression was ready to give this a full pass until I played a different class that better suited my interests, but even that class I played originally was eventually able to become something rather enjoyable. I wish the game would let you dabble with those subclasses in action before cementing you permanently into one, but it does encourage alts, and the progression in the beginning of the game is decently fast-paced. The shop's most notable feature is the mass of cosmetics, each available in a variety of colors and plenty of options for each character to choose from to help differentiate yourself from another player of the same class. You can even choose a multitude of colors to dye them if those options aren't what you're looking for. While the outfits do contain minor stat boosts, they are all earnable within the game itself, and the shop's outfits don't have better stat options just because you bought them. It's just a grind skip and an outfit preference. Getting elite status can also help with that grind, and the daily rewards are pretty legit and useful. Just not any kind of requirement for a casual player. A decent option if you're looking to support the game and just want some boosts. I swear I've included this note on every other beat-em-up MMO before, but these games are pretty repetitive. No matter your mode or playstyle, you're gonna end up settling into a rhythm when autopilot mode kicks in, and you've entered the same area for the fifth time because only now does killing the mob you've killed four times earlier count as quest progression. It can hit you all at once. The flash can only hold your attention for so long. The graphics, while okay for their style, definitely don't feel like they're pushing any envelopes, and the overall style doesn't feel special enough on its own to feel timeless, so it definitely feels like a product of its time, even if that time wasn't that long ago. The 480p resolution cutscenes might quickly remind you. There's a reason people keep making that mobile port mistake. Updates on this game have been... strange. Trading has been disabled for a good while while the PvP was locked to very high levels for several updates, and became almost impossible to play or even get into matches. People who enjoy this game fear for its future, and with another title on Unmasked's Horizon that looks like a much better, updated, and cleaner version of this game, we might not have all that much time with it to begin with. Next time, we're going to break some rules ever so slightly so we can shoehorn in a Halloween episode on a game that's getting a plenty of bit of press right now, for good and for bad. I wonder what's coming next!
Hey, thanks for sticking around past the credits. I know I got like these 20 second end cards to do now, but I need to take a little bit of time. So I have to thank a Patreon user very specifically for supporting this show at the Guild Leader level, who would like to promote their book, Innocent Parasite, which is available on Amazon, and I'll have the link in the description for you. So feel free to check that out if you're interested. Otherwise, you can wait for those little windows to pop up and click on whichever one to your heart's desire. I don't care. YouTube's a mess. 